Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the uh, our next uh, workshop today. It's further change with analysis. Uh, thank you to Rebecca and Jamie. So we have uh, Dr. Rebecca Kilig from University of Lancaster. Uh, she will be running this workshop for us. And uh, Jamie Chapman uh, from the NHS uh, in Manchester, she will be helping and answering your questions. So please make sure you uh, ask them in the chat box. Um, also, uh, I will share the link to materials shortly. I assume they are on GitHub. And uh, after the um, workshop, we might ask you to fill the evaluation form. Uh, so please uh, keep an eye on the chat at the end uh, to get the link for the feedback form. Uh, and uh, I don't think there's anything else from me. So over to you, Rebecca. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, thanks again for inviting me to give this second session. So the, the first session was two weeks ago, where we were talking about introduction to change points. And today we're going to talk about further issues. And I'm hoping to leave a bit of time for discussion at the end um, for those um, to kind of discuss any issues that I, maybe I haven't covered and, and you'd like to discuss. Uh, so Jamie Lee's um, with me again today. So she's from Wrightington Wigan and Lee Trust. Um, today uh, and she'll be helping me monitor the chat again as, as last time um, so yeah if there's any questions that, that you want to ask please just add it to the chat and um, the github um, link has just gone into the chat directly and um, on there there's a link to the course materials and um, I will just share my screen so you guys can um, see this so this is the uh, GitHub for, for the course. Um, here we've got, um, these are just the cache, just so that it's quicker to build for you guys. Um, I'm gonna be using um, this A&E Galstone proportion data today. Uh, so you'll need to download that. That's just uh, an our data file there. Then there's the, the PDF. And if you want the markdown version so that you can run everything as we go, then that's there as well. Um, so that's really the, the data that you need today. Uh, you'll also, um, I'm just thinking, no, actually, no, that, that's the only data that, that you'll need today for, for that. Um, so I'm going to um, just switch to the slides now. Um, so today, um, as I said, I'm going to talk about um, some other aspects. Uh, one of the feedback form from the last session was that I did rush a bit towards the end on the checking assumptions. So I'm just going to recover that again uh, quickly this morning um, and kind of discuss um, some issues there. And then the main things that we're going to talk about this morning are how to deal with autocorrelation and what the auto effect autocorrelation has um, on the data that we were talking previously. Um, I'm going to talk about influence and I'm going to talk about multivariate change points. So the influence stuff is um, really brand new, hot off the press. Um, we're just about to submit the paper for it. So um, that's going to be kind of, I'm going to cover that a bit more towards the end. I know you won't have a task on that, but if anybody's interested um, going forwards, then please do um, let me know. Um, and I'm very happy to, to kind of help you through that. Again, like, like the last session, there will be some tasks um, through the sections, and then hopefully we can um, kind of work through those uh, together. So just as a recall from, from two weeks ago, um, just refresh our memories, what, what are change points? Um, so we've got some data. Um, I'm going to still talk about univariate for the first part of the, of the session, then we're going to move on to multivariate data later. So we've got some data Y, and if a change point exists, then at some time point tau, the data prior to tau and the data after tau are different in some way. And that can be in any, any type of um, change that we're wanting to look at. And some of the issues that we're going to discuss today, um, especially around the autocorrelation, are how, how do you choose that model? Um, how do you choose what parameters are changing? What type of model to have for your data? People are used to kind of looking at data and coming up with a statistical model and then kind of checking the assumptions for that. And we kind of get, get a good feeling, don't we? But as soon as you have change points in the data, especially if they're hard to, hard to see um, visually, then it can be difficult to try and choose that model structure. Um, so today we're gonna to use um, four different packages. So we've got the, the change point package, which we used last time. And uh, that's the, 
kind of the backbone for, for all of the packages um, that um, I develop. Then the MCPT, um, it was originally developed and um, motivated by some environmental science applications. Um, but that, um, that, that was kind of the, the basis for, for why it's called MCPT, but it's, it's more broadly applicable than, than the environmental sciences. And this is gonna be the main thing that we're gonna use for, for our model choice. Um, so um, we're gonna talk about that. I'm going to talk about change point dry influences. This is my brand new package. Um, it's not quite on CRAN yet, um, but it's it's on GitHub. So um, uh, it will be getting sent to CRAN when, when we send the paper off. I just got some final man file things to, to do on that. Um, and then change point .geo, which is, um, this is the multivariate package that we're going to use today. Um, I've noted some other multivariate packages. Uh, so I, I noted, um, univariate ones in the last session. So there's some other multivariate ones here that might be interesting. So there's ECP um, for energy statistics. So that's really non-parametric changes. Um, Inspect change point does um, the mean only projection direction method. I'm going to kind of talk about that a little bit. There's HD Binseg from Hiran Chow at Bristol. Uh, and that does the double QSIM statistic. Again, non-parametric change in mean. Um, and then Bayes project also does <coughs> Sorry. also does some um, multivariate uh, change point, but is from a Bayesian framework. Just if you, if you want to be Bayesian rather than frequentist. Okay, so previously we, we were talking about the normal test for, for change points. Uh, we looked at the uh, change in mean, we looked at the change in variance, and we looked at both the change in mean and variance for normal or for um, Poisson or for exponentially distributed data. In all of those, we've got the um, assumption that the data points within each segment are independent and that the segments themselves, the parameters of those segments are independent as well across time. So for a change in mean, you've also got um, obviously the normal distribution assumption here if you're using the normal likelihood ratio. And you've also got the assumption that the variance is constant across the data. So. The problem with checking assumptions for change points is that you need to know where the change point locations are in order to check your assumptions. So if you don't know where the change point locations are, um, then um, if you think about it, you've got um, two mean distributions, kind of a low mean and a high mean. If you look at the um, histogram for that, for example, it will just look like a, a bimodal, you know, you've got a mixture of normal distributions. And so any test for normality or any test for independence is, is just not going to um, be valid because you've got these mixture distributions coming through. And the assumptions that you're making are not on the entire data. The assumptions that you're making are on a segment by segment basis, okay? So that the data points within a segment are independent. Um, there's no, it's normally distributed within a segment. And this is where these piecewise properties kind of come in. The, the nice thing about um, change points is that you're piecing together stationary components. So um, kind of uh, pieces of data where the, the properties are constant. And so the properties that, that we're assuming are within that segment, not across the whole data. So we need to know where the change points are to be able to check our assumptions. So one way that we like to check our assumptions um, is using the residuals. So if you think about it, if I was to check these on a segment by segment basis, I have, I maybe have some short segments, I maybe have um, some, um, well, short segments is the, is the main one that's the problem, because if you've got a small um, segment of data, and you're trying to check normality, then the, you know, the variance of that is, is just going to be um, potentially quite large. And, and the test is not going to be properly sized for, for that small amount of data. So the easiest way to do it is to check the residuals. So we will estimate the mean. And so we have this um, um, data set that, that we used previously, this uh, M1, um, and this is M1.amoc here, where we did a change in mean. We've just got um, one change here at time point 100. Um, and we can get the parameter estimates using this um, param.est. Uh, function on, on the output, on the CPT object. And then 
the contents of that list vary depending on what assumptions you've made. If, you've, if you're assuming a normal distribution uh, with a change in mean, then you have a mean component to that list. Um, and that will detail the mean for every individual segment. So to get the mean for every single time point, we can just do this um, repeat command. And so we're repeating those means that we've got um, and seg.len just gives us the length of the segment. So each element in this vector is going to be repeated the segment length number of times. So what that does is that gives us a vector that gives us the mean at every single time point. And then to get the residuals, all we can do is, is take our original data and remove the estimated mean at every time point. And because that, um, because we're using a normal change in mean model, that means that the res these are the residuals directly. This is the um, data minus the mean here. That's the, the residuals. So these should be normally distributed with mean zero and varying sigma squared, because we're assuming the same variance for each segment. Okay, And so that then means that we can test this um, for normality, we can test this for independence. And so one test for normality would be the Shapiro-Wilk test here. Let me just close that. Um, would be the Shapiro-Wilk test, which then gives you, um, you know, a p-value. This um, this is a test of normality. So we're not rejecting the null that the um, the the data is generated from a normal distribution because our p-value is larger than zero point zero five. If you prefer a Kamal-Graf-Smirnov test, you could do the same same test here. And again, I'm I'm looking at a p-norm where my mean. So I, I could set this mean to be zero here and the standard deviation to be whatever um, I've um, generated, or, or I can set the mean to be the mean and the standard deviation to be the standard deviation. Um, this here then is, um, again, a, a p-value um, where you're wanting something larger than 0 0.05. We can look at QQ plots of the residuals and um, to, to check that normality again, if, if you prefer that, a visual check rather than um, a test. And we can also look at the autocorrelation function for the independence assumption. So here, here we have um, the, the variance, which is around one, which is good. That's what we simulated. And then the rest of um, the um, lags are all within our confidence band. So we, we are confident that, again, we can say this is independent. Again, you could use a test for independence here as well. It's, it really depends on your, on your preference at this stage of how you want to check these assumptions. So if you want to have a look and remind yourself of how change points um, can distort these tests um, if you don't use the residuals, please look at the, at the last um, uh, session that we were in. So that's kind of just a recap for the residuals. Does anybody have any questions at this stage about the, the checking assumptions? I'll just wait a minute and see if anything comes through on the chat. Okay. If there's no questions, um, I'll move on to discussing autocorrelation. So I see somebody's already asked a question about the intuitive definition of it, autocorrelation, and Jamie's given a very good answer there. Um, but essentially, autocorrelation, um, I'm going to show you in these next few plots what happens to, to the data. So this is just um, normally distributed data. This is independent. Uh, we've got first um, set is from 100 observations from a standard normal. And then we've got a normal with um, mean three here. And then I'm just plotting the, the mean var um, um, uh, analysis here using pelt. And so this gives us a single change point. We could have used AMOC or we could have just used CPT mean here. But I, I just kind of want to demonstrate that it, it doesn't really matter um, whether your variance is changing or not at, at this point. So, so we've got... Um, um, this kind of gives us a change in mean at time point 100, as, as we're expecting. If we then look at positive autocorrelation, so this is exactly the same 
um, series here, we've got a mean zero here. We've got, um, well, this ends up being a mean, a mean of 10 at this point because of the way I've generated the data. Um, and, but I've used the same error process. So the same error process here um, with a, uh, so the same here uh, process here, but the error process now is in AR1. Okay. And I've put in the, um, in the GitHub a, um, a file that can simulate um, AR1 um, with change points. And so this is this function simcpt.ar1. Um, that's the kind of source um, of that function there. I'm using the same seed as I did before. So exactly the same error terms are being used. Um, and I'm going to put change, just as I did before, change points at 100. So we've got um, the beginning of the data change point at 100 and the end of the data is 200. Um, the way this is initiated um, is that I'm, this is my um, um, initial kind of mean set here. Um, and then I have a um, initialization parameter. So if I didn't want to initialize with it with a with a zero, I can initialize with something else. And then beta, these are my coefficients. So I'm having um, a zero here. Um, so I start with um, a mean of zero and a autocorrelation of 0.9. I then go to a mean of one with an autocorrelation of 0.9. Okay, and then my sigma squared here, just so the sigma squared is exactly the same as what it was previously. And um, so uh, the um, overall variance for a process for an AR1 is um, sigma squared over one minus phi squared um, for an AR1 process. And so, so this is, this is um, what I'm controlling for here. Um, just so that the, the total variance here of this process is, is one, just like it was for the prior example. So what we can see here is that we're going from something that looks like this, which is, is jumping around in, in a normally distributed way here to this, which is not. So every time point is heavily related to the last. So my AR1 coefficient is 0.9, which means the time point I'm at now is my mean behavior plus my 0.9 times my prior behavior, okay? So this, this is why I'm getting up to a, um, a mean of 10 here because I'm compounding 0.9 times my previous observation, okay? And then I've got my normally distributed error terms on, on that as well, okay? So every time point here is heavily correlated with the last time point and so because of that, we will get runs. So, so I kind of call these runs of, of increases and decreases. And these runs are what causes um, problems in, in the change point setting. So we're going from this, which um, has a change point just at time point 100. This also has a change point only at time point 100. The difference is before and after the change point, um, it's the whole series is autocorrelated, heavily autocorrelated. So we get these runs and that confuses the change point process, okay? Uh, or the change point algorithm. So for a start, it means that, that our change point here is, is not linear, okay? Um, sorry, it's, it's not instant in, in that setting because as, as we're going here across time, we're kind of increasing because we're always 0.9 on, on our last one. And so, so we've kind of got this little slope going on here. We've got um, the data prior to the change point here. We've got lots of runs in, the, in this side of the data. And so therefore we're getting, you know, you can, you can clearly see why um, this change in mean is, is here um, because this data is much higher than this data here. So this is much lower than this data here. So you can see why the, um, the algorithm has selected these change point locations. It happens that after the change point, there's, um, there's, there's not as many runs, and so therefore for we do get a flat setting there, but that's purely random, okay? There's no re inherent reason why this side is, is different from this side because of the way it's been simulated. Um, and so from this point, we're kind of saying, well, we're going from, this is what we should have. We should have a change in, a single change in mean at time point 100, 
And positive autocorrelation means that we get the runs, which means we, we typically will get more change points than there should be there. Okay. In contrast, when we look at a negative correlation, okay, so all I've changed here is I've added a negative sign in front of these because I'm still looking at 0.9 uh, squared here. Uh, nothing changes there, but we've got a point, a negative point line. That is the only thing that I've changed from here to here. Okay. And so now the series looks very, very different. So for negative autocorrelation, whereas positive autocorrelation was um, the time, you know, the time point I'm currently at is heavily dependent on the time point previously. So you get the, the runs. Now the time point that I'm currently at is negatively dependent on the last time point. So if if I have um, so it's it's that my current time point is equal to my mean behavior um, plus my negative coefficient times my last data point. So that will basically give give you up and down behavior going on. So if my last time point was was positive, then I'm suddenly going to go negative, etc because I've got this mean of zero going on here. So where my jumps previously were, were all in the same direction, now my jumps are in opposite directions. So I'm, I'm kind of going up and down and up and down. And that's what's happening here. And so here it's a lot, so, so here it was clear to see that the change at, at 100, um, but it was, it was masked by um, other things here. I, I mean, I, I can see the change at 100. It's kind of, um, sorry, it's, it's this bit here, but it's very, very hard to see. And if, if you use the change point approach naively, thinking that it's independent data, then you get this change point right at, right at the end. So the change point is placed in the wrong place. So we're correct in saying that we have one change point, but it's not anywhere near what the right place where it should be. So these are the problems that come when we have autocorrelation in our data and we do not take account of it. So if you are going to use that independent assumption, I would strongly urge you to check your residuals for, for this depend, for independence, because you could be in this situation where you have more change points than, than should be there, or you could be in this situation where, where you either have it in the wrong place or the majority of time, um, if, if you use some different seeds here, it will find no change point whatsoever. Okay. So typically negative autocorrelation means that you'll get fewer change points and positive means you'll get more um, in general. Um, and so in real life, the majority of time series that I've come across are positively correlated. Um, they're not as strong as this 0.9, um, but yeah. Um, George is right. It is it is more difficult to deal with negative autocorrelation than it is with positive, but positive has more di more disastrous effects because you can actually infer things um, are changing, and you look at this um, you look at this and, and you can believe that things are changing that often because because of the the runs within the data, and so you can falsely be led to to infer that change points have happened when they really haven't. Okay. So on that note, I'm going to talk about, well, how can we deal with this? So one way of dealing with this autocorrelation, I should say, um, is you can inflate your penalty. So if you know what the autocorrelation is, then you can um, multiply your penalty by the autocorrelation, uh, and then that, that will inflate your penalty to take account of this. The problem is that we often don't know what the autocorrelation is, and we don't know if it's changing over time. Uh, and so that can be a problem. If you're using the crops method, you can also use the crops method to try uh, from previously, that was where we used a range of penalties and we kind of judged based on, based on an elbow plot. That's also useful for when you have autocorrelation. But the, the way we can confidently kind of take that into account is to actually put that autocorrelation into our model structure, okay? So it's very, very difficult in change points to have global um, parameters. So I'm, we're kind of working on, on a project at the moment that's looking at that, but that's not ready yet for, for dissemination. 
Um, but it's very, very difficult to, to have global parameters because the way that the search methods work is that they assume independence of these segments. And as soon as you have a parameter that's global, you can't estimate that because you need to know where the change points are to be able to estimate that. So imagine this, the case where we have that global variance. If I wanted to estimate that global variance, um, then that means that I will um, have to know where the means are, mean changes are because the global variance is, is defined as the data point minus the mean at that time point. Sorry, George, Osh, yeah, global parameters mean um, parameters that don't change for each segment so that the, the, um, they stay constant over time. Um, whereas the local parameters are kind of going to be um, the things that, that are segment dependent. So depending on which segment you're in, the parameters are different. So MCPT is, is an R package um, that's been available on CAM for a few years now, and it fits 12 different models to your data. So this kind of MCPT came out of, I, I said at the beginning, from the environmental sciences. And there you have maybe lots of different locations where, you know, we're talking maybe hundreds or thousands of locations and you, you need to fit change point models, but they all behave in a slightly different way. So some will be um, a flat mean, some will have trends, some will have autocorrelation, some won't. Um, and so we needed a, a, a method that was out there um, to automatically analyze all of those time series without somebody having to go through and say, that's a mean shift, that's a trend, that one has autocorrelation, that one doesn't. Um, so we need something automatic. And so what MCPT does is it fits these 12 different models to your data um, one is just a flat mean, so no change point whatsoever. Um, we've got a flat mean plus AL1, we've got a flat mean plus AL2, um, we've got a flat mean plus a change point, um, which is just the CPT mean that we were using uh, last uh, two weeks ago. We've got a flat mean plus AL1 plus change point and a flat mean plus AL2 plus change point, and then all of those same models, but with a trend component as well. And so the trend component in MCPT is fixed. It has to be by time. You can put in um, a kind of a date format for that, or you can just use the index, you know, time point one, two, three, et cetera. That obviously affects the estimate that you're getting out, but the, the models are, are equivalent between the two. So I've just kind of put AR1. This is an autogressive of order one. So that means that the time point now depends only on the time point previously. And AR2 is the time point now depends both on the previous time point and two time points ago. So it's kind of the degree of um, dependence there. We call that the order of the model. So the great thing about fitting these 12 different models is that we the um, the software allows you to kind of automatically say which one is the best model. Okay. So all of the change point models by default will use the MBIC penalty, but you can put in different um, penalties if you, if you want to use different ones. You have to use the same penalty for all of the models, um, otherwise they're, they're not comparable. Um, or it kind of doesn't make sense to compare them. Um, so the bonus there is that you can see which model is best. Um, because they're all likelihood fits, and they're all nested models, we can just compare the, the likelihoods using AIC, BIC. So if you remember from two weeks ago, I said AIC can't be used for change points. And it can't because um, it's not consistent in estimating the change point locations and the number of change points. But when we're doing model comparison, if you know, provided you're not using AIC for, for the um, change point model fits, you can use AIC for that comparison across models. OK, because um, that's a bit different because you've, you're not using it to choose the number of parameters, you're using it to choose the model across. Okay. So the downside here is that if, if you kind of become reliant on using MCPT, it means you're not looking at your data in the same way. And so therefore, you may miss the fact that a completely different model might be appropriate. For example, a seasonal model. Okay. So the downside of it is that you're not looking, you're not checking. So you need to have extra extra um, checks in there, extra um, um, diagnostics to kind of highlight ones that might be problematic from, from this automatic procedure. Okay. So let me show you how easy it is to do. 
So I'm going to use this uh, sim cptar1 function again. Um, I've just got the, the same as I did um, a few slides ago. I've got positive 0.9. So, so it's this example here that I'm looking at. Um, exactly the same C, so it's exactly that example. And all I need to do is MCPT of, of my data. So if you don't want the 12 models, if you only want a mean fit or you only want a trend fit, then or you don't want AR1, AR2, then you can inside that specify which models you do and do not want it to fit out of the 12. Um, but this is this is kind of the default will fit all 12 models. And um, it then comes up with um, a little uh, bar that will, you know, show you how far through it is fitting those 12 models. Some are faster than others because they've got less parameters, they're not searching for change points, etc. And then um, you can use BIC, equivalently you can use AIC on here to get the, um, the kind of AIC, BIC fits for these, um, fits for these models based on the likelihoods. Um, and then you can do which.min to find out which one is the best. So which, which model out of those 12 has the minimum BIC? And it will give you um, both a title here and also a number. And so the title is helpful because that kind of goes, oh, oh, I know that is a mean model with an AR1 term and potential change points there. And then the five gives you an indication of what model number it was. And you may or may not find that useful because when, when you're automating, it can be difficult to automate doing a dollar sign. And this, it can be easier just to, to pick the five um, coming out. So we can then do a plot. So if we just do plot of that MCPT object, um, it gives me this diagnostic plot here. So you've got the data at the bottom. You've then got all of the different fits um, going up. If it's got a star on any of the change point ones, it means it didn't find a change point. OK, so these mean AR2, trend AR1, trend AR2 did not find change points. And so therefore their fits are exactly equivalent to, um, for example, this trend AR2 here. OK. Um, where you do have change points, you've got vertical lines on, on, on the um, model fits to show you where they are. Okay. So the best one here was mean AR1 change point. So we've got mean AR1 change point is going to be this one here, which has a change point directly at 100, which is where we were expecting it to be. So we've not messed with our penalty, we've not done anything like that. All we've done is included the fact that we expect AR1 autocorrelation into our model and so therefore that removes all of those extra change points that we were finding um, here. So look at all of these extra change points here have disappeared because we've estimated that AR1 structure and we know that the change point therefore is at time point 100 and all of the changes that we see previously here are just due to autocorrelation, okay? So we can then, you might say, okay, that's great if I wanna look at this diagnostic, but how do I actually get the information for the best model? So from this um, out, um, as I said, um, the, all of the entries are named. So you can just do dollar, they're, they're just a list. So you can do dollar and then whatever name comes out here for the model uh, is the same name that is in the list structure. And because this itself is an object from um, the change point package, so it's a CPT object, you can use everything that we, we discussed two weeks ago. So you can use CPTS on that to get the change points, which is at 100. Um, you can do a plot of it. So this plot here um, gives me the plot of the um, original data and the fit over it. Um, so you'll notice here I'm doing which min, um, min BIC out plus one. So this is just another way of accessing um, the fit. So when you do an MCPT object, the first um, element in the list is all of the likelihoods and the number of parameters that have been fitted for each of the different 12 models. And so therefore, when we do which model is the best, we need to remember to plus one to that because um, the first element in the list is um, just a, a summary. So we can do which is the minimum plus one, and then that will plot um, the change point um, process there, which will give you that um, fitted line on top. The fitted line includes the AR1 component. Um, there are ways that you can stop that if, if, if you just want to get the, the flat mean before and afterwards. Um, but um, for these kind of plots here, we felt that it, it wasn't really, didn't really make sense if, if we kind of had 
the the mean change point and the mean AR1 change point looking the same because they didn't include the AR1 term. So we made a decision that we were going to include the AR1 term um, inside that model fit. And then I just um, added the change points here. So um, out mean AR1 change points just as before and just colored it blue. Okay. So that clearly shows that when we include the AR1 term, um, we get the correct answer and, and all of those extra change points were just due to um, autocorrelation. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to set you a task. Um, so we're going to look at this some A and E data. So this is um, this is the proportion of admissions inside A and E across the whole of the UK for gallstone disease, and it's over this ten, ten year period here from January 2010 to December 2019, and it's a monthly data here. So if if I just kind of look at this data, I can see a trend component here. But then that trend component, it, it doesn't continue at that point. So maybe there's a change point around here that, that then and may, maybe the trend continues after that. So if you download the gallstone data, um, you can plot it. Um, the first column is the dates. And the second column here is, is the um, proportions. And so I, I just want you to, to take um, a few minutes here. We're going to have um, a task and a break as before. So I'm going to give you um, 15 minutes for both. Um, shouldn't take you hopefully more than um, five minutes or so to do this and then a 10, a 10 minute break. So where are we? We're five past. So um, yeah, so if we come back at 22 minutes past and I'd like you to use um, the MCPT package to see if there's any, any evidence for changes and look at what model is fit. Is, is it just a trend model? Is there autocorrelation there? Have a look. Okay, so I'm going to leave you there for. Uh, we're going to come back at 22 minutes past. Um, so make sure you all have a break and, and get away from the screen. Uh, Jamie and I, uh, one of us, will be here to answer any questions in the chat if if you uh, need any help. And so if you do the plot of that, so again, I just did um, MCPT with all the default options there. Got trend AR1 as the as the best. And if you look at um, the different models that were fit, these were kind of what came out. So the mean change point here had several change points kind of all the way through, almost on an increasing step level here. And this is what happens if you have a trend within the data, but you don't actually um, take account of it. Um, if you just fit a mean change point model, you'll get lots of increasing steps here. And this is kind of indicative that maybe a trend model might be better for, for your data. Obviously there are instances where a trend model is not appropriate and this is actually how the, the data behaves. Um, but in this instance, a trend, um, it's, it's kind of clear to me that this is not a series of, of mean steps. This is actually a trend. So I'm, I'm quite happy that, that the trend model has been picked here. Uh, if you just have a trend with a change point, then you get two breaks. You get a first one here and a second. So a first one kind of here and a second one here. So you can kind of see why this is coming in because this maybe has a, has a lower trend than, than this aspect. Um, but what it's showing us here is because trend change point AR1 is picked is that this behavior here that maybe looks like it might be a change point is just down to autocorrelation. Okay, so this is down to autocorrelation. So George just has said, looking by the time by eyes, not sure. Um, so this time series, the way I've plotted it here, I, I have kind of stretched the time axis. Um, if, you, if you just plot it normally in R, this break here is glaringly obvious. Um, so yeah, may, maybe it's on my, on my next plot, but you can... Um, so if you look at trend AR1 change point, again here, you can, you can clearly see that there's a, there's a dip, okay? You may argue there's another dip here, but um, yeah. So if we look at the kind of standard plot here, um, you can clearly see this break. And again, this is kind of um, um, looking at um, different aspects. So again, it, this is exactly the same data plot as is here. The difference is here I've elongated the access access and here I haven't. So this is a lesson to us all as well. And um, 
I mean, I, I could certainly believe that there might be a change point here as, as well, but they're saying that with autocorrelation, um, that kind of can take account of that. Um, there is a, a long kind of standing debate um, around autocorrelation versus change points, because actually, if you just put an autocorrelation term in your data, you'll actually get a pretty good fit generally. And um, the fit around the change point will be um, not as good, um, you know, if this was potentially a change point here. Um, but you can see that it, it kind of quickly recovers here because it's that lag one autocorrelation. So for the first time point after the change, you're still thinking it's 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 based on kind of the first um, mean or, or trend behavior. But as soon as you go two time points past, you're then being based on on the last point, which was from the new segment. So an AR1 model just by itself with no change points can actually fit a change point model, a, a change point generation pro generated process quite well. Um, so, you know, there's arguments there as to, well, in that sense, do we need change point models? What added benefit do, do change point models give? And part of that is that sometimes the change points themselves are, are the meaningful thing. So here, um, I was asking them, um, the consultant that kind of gave me this data, what's going on here? And it's in the, so it's a change in the proportion. So one thought could be that, well, maybe a &E admissions went up, but the proportion, um, but the number of Goldstone admissions remain the same. And that would account for a drop in um, the proportion here. Uh, another um, probably more plausible explanation is a recoding. So the, 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 the way that a and &E admissions were coded um, for um, gallstones has changed and maybe there's different codes were, were used. And so this was at this time point. So he's currently looking into that. This is a data set we're, we're currently analyzing together. Um, and so, yeah, so he's currently looking into if there was any recoding done around this time. Um, if you want to know the date of that, then you can use the date aspect and just say, um, select the date observation that relates to the change point, and that was the, the 1st of February 2017 um, was, was that time point. Um, and then again, we can just do plot of that output because that's a change point object that gives us this fit um, included automatically. And there's a break there um, in, in the trend component. So I'm going to um, move on to talk about multivariates. So as I said, there's two more things I want to talk about. We've got an hour left together. And um, so when we're kind of moving from the univariate, so univariate is where we just have one time series, just like we've been talking about two weeks ago and th this morning. Multivariate is now moving to whereby we have several time series. So for example, in, in the Schoolstone data, this was the a and &E admissions across the whole of England. And um, what we could have done is we could have looked at the same data, but on a per hospital basis. And then I would have many, many hospitals all with these proportions of a and &E admissions. And maybe I want to be looking at um, change points in those. Um, some questions that you might want to ask are, you know, do all um, hospitals have the same pattern? So do they all have a change point in the same location? And um, to do that, what you could do is you could just do a univariate analysis on each individual one. So if the process is, uh, so I'm going to call, um, in this multivariate setting, I'm going to call um, each time series a channel. So that's kind of um, almost, almost like a, a row. It's, it's, it's a channel here. Uh, and each channel could be unconnected. So it could be, you know, hospital admissions. Um, in different areas of the country are completely unrelated to each other, okay? In which case, doing this repeated univariate analysis, so treating each, each time series as completely separate from each other and just doing individual univariate analysis on each, and then maybe comparing and seeing if change points are at similar locations across different hospitals, that could be appropriate, okay? But if, if we're kind of thinking about this, um, there may be some shared structure. So for example, if we were looking at that recoding, that recoding probably would have happened at, at all the hospitals and that, so therefore you expect all the hospitals to have that change point. If some of those individual analyses don't show that change point, that doesn't mean it's not there. Um, as we kind of discussed two weeks ago, it could just mean that the, it's too small a change 
with everything else, with the variability that, that they're seeing, et cetera, it just might not be able to be found, okay? So the benefit of a multivariate analysis is that knowing that all of the other hospitals are changing at the same time will give you more confidence that that small change is actually a change, okay? Because it's not that we can't see that, we can see the small changes um, within our time series, the barrier is not that we can't see them. The barrier is, are they um, kind of, I don't, I don't want to use significant, but are they significant enough? As in, are they large enough that they have a, have a positive impact when we include a change point on the fit of our model? Because when we include change points, we're including extra parameters. And so we kind of have this parsimony argument here of there needs to be a benefit to the fit of the model that's large enough, this is what our penalty is doing. It's saying, is the benefit to the fit of the model large enough that we want to include those extra parameters? Okay. So when we are doing multivariate analysis, it may then become um, beneficial to have a change point in, in that, in that um, time series. So if there is shared structure across the channels, maybe that's they all change at the same time. Um, maybe changes are in some, but not all, um, you know, it could be that there's actually um, correlation across the time series um, that you want to take into account. I'm not going to talk about that today, but that, that's possible too as well. So, but the nature of the change could also be different in, in each channel. So it may be that you kind of have um, completely, completely separate things. So you might want to look at A&E admissions for gallstones plus um, uh, selective plus GP referrals plus um, maybe adverse outcomes or something like that from surgeries. And you might want to look at all of those things together and see, do they have similar change points? Um, or, you know, where are the change points in these? What could be driving and um, what's going on from, um, from our time points? And so for each of those, you might not want to assume the same model. And the wonderful thing about multi the way we're talking about with multivariate stuff is you don't have to assume the same model for everyone. So what I'm talking about today isn't directly going to assume that it's the same model in, a, in every single time series, but it is going to assume that we can analyze those time series in, in a unified way. And there's loads of different things I'm sure that you can think of as to what might be interesting about multivariate series. So from the kind of statistical end now, what's the problems? What are the challenges that we see? So when we have multivariate time series, there's added computational expense because we've got, you know, n by, so we, we typically um, say n by p uh, data points. And so it then becomes challenging in terms of how do you analyze those um, in an efficient way. p by one, uh, sorry, n by one, very easy to do. Uh, n by p, much more difficult. Um, there's challenges over the sparsity of change points. So do you want to make an assumption that the changes are only in a small amount of the time series, in a large amount of time series, in all of the time series? How do we kind of incorporate that? And we want this multivariate power. So we want this ability to say that just because there's been a small change, and if I look univariately, I don't see it. I want to be able to use the information from the other time series to help me identify that change. So this is an example of a, of a, of a multivariate time series. I plotted it as a colored image just because it's easier to, to visualize. So each of these dots and um, the color is related to the magnitude. So just like we would do previously. And so um, these are all of our different variables of, of the Y axis. And then across um, the X axis is time just as it normally would be. And so what we can see is that, is that all of these different um, uh, time series here, they tend to so we've simulated a change at 500. They all change in different ways. So some of them, we've got a block kind of here that's denser. So, so that kind of has um, a lower value than this lighter block at the top. And then you can clearly see going over this yellow line, the change from a lighter color to a darker color. That means that the mean is decreasing and it's decreasing, I should say, because we've got this on the right hand side saying the darker is the lower values. Okay. And so you can see the block in the middle, it's much harder to see that shift, okay? Because I've labeled that line as yellow, you know, it, it may be more obvious if I hadn't have put that on, you know, the question would be, would you be able to see it? 
Now, if you know there's a change in, in this top set and the bottom set, then your eyes are kind of trained to looking at that area and you can, you know, you can then believe, you know, make yourself believe that there's a change left to right um, in the middle set of series. But that's essentially what we're doing from a statistical perspective. So because we know there's a change in these other areas, that makes us more likely to see a change in, in these other variables, okay, even if it's small. Right, so that's kind of the intuition of what's going on here in this multivariate setting. So there are many different methods. Um, there's some well-known approaches. This is kind of a very open area in, in, um, in the change point literature. Um, it's relatively new, as you can see from, from these uh, dates here. Um, ECP is, that paper was both univariate and multivariate. There's the inspect method from Wang and Samworth. Again, I've kind of linked, um, these are all hyperlinks. Um, and then the double Q sum from here in 2016. So all, all of these papers have been out recently. There's been many, many more since during um, various different things. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is um, GeomCP. So these methods here, what they do um, is they transform your data from a N by P time series into an N by one time series. And that's what they're doing. So they're summarizing all of those P different variables in a single number. And so what INSPECT does here is um, it takes Q sums uh, test statistics, which um, is a non-parametric uh, method uh, for a change in mean, and it takes the Q sums of each individual time series and then projects those Q sums into um, a different space, down to a one dimensional space. Okay. Uh, the double Q sum does something similar, whereby it takes Q sums and then it takes Q sums of Q sums, um, but it does transformation um, in the middle. Um, so all of these, basically their goal is to go from an M by P to an M by one. And they're all looking at um, primarily changes in first order statistics. That's means and ECP can do medians as well, but um, they're, they're mainly looking at this kind of first order statistics. But as we've kind of discovered, a lot of the time in real data, when we have a change in mean or trend, we will also have a change in variance. Okay. So GeomCP here kind of comes from that intuition and, and it kind of says, well, you're going to need different projection directions. So different ways of summarizing uh, the data whether you're looking for a change in mean or you're looking for a change in variance. So kind of this first order and second order structure. So what we, what we kind of came about with is, is, well, you don't really want a single time series that you're going to project down to. You, you want to be looking at, you know, for a mean and variance, maybe a two dimensional time series. So GeomCP, uh, you can clearly extend that to, you know, maybe many other things that you're interested in and have, you know, a number smaller than P time series to look at, but we're gonna look at two because we're interested in both mean and variance. So this comes kind of from a geometric interpretation. So I've, I've done it in two dimensions here. It obviously clearly extends to up to P dimensions, but it's a lot harder to think about in P dimensions. So I'm just gonna demonstrate it in two dimensions. So I've got here clouds of points and these clouds are, are my data. And uh, I've kind of, squash the time aspect here. So this is a bit like considering, um, you know, just a scatter plot or, or a, a, a line, a dot line of all of the points um, across time. Okay, so I'm ignoring the time aspect here. But the clouds of points are from different times. So they're from different segments, but they've just been plotted on the same graph so that I can demonstrate this concept. So say we start off with these black points here. A mean shift is, is like shifting these black points to the blue points, okay? So that is going from, roughly speaking, in, in the first variable, a mean of three to a mean of five, and in the second variable, similarly to a mean of three to a mean of five. Now, you can clearly see that the different changes in mean in different variables are going to move this cloud of points in different ways. If, if only x2 changed, then this cloud of points would just move up or down, okay? So you can kind of think about that cloud of points moving around for a change in mean. Okay. So the way that we can find that move 
um, in this in this p-dimensional space is that we can look at the distance. So we're going to have a pre-prescribed point, and um, we're just going to use a uh, zero zero here, um, and we're going to look at the distance from this pre-prescribed point to all of our different data points. Okay, so you look at the distance there, and to this first set of points um, in black, those distances are going to be smaller than to the second cloud of points in blue. Okay. And regardless of where this cloud of points moves, the, those distances are going to be different. Okay. So therefore, we can find changes in mean behavior by looking at the distances and looking for changes in mean of those distances the mean around here will always be um, kind of around um, um, yeah, kind of like this distance here, all going to be normally distributed if we assume a normal distribution of original points around there. And then if we move to here, they're going to be normally distributed but around this larger distance. Okay. I'm going to show you these summaries in, in a minute. And then if you think about a change in variance, well, the change in variance is like going from these blue points here, uh, sorry, these uh, black points here to the green points. So the mean is still the same in both of the, of the variables, but the green points are more spread out than, um, than the black points, okay. or the circles and the triangles. So if we, look, um, if, we, if we looked at the distances though, the average distance would probably still be the same because the mean is still the same. Okay. What's different here is that if, if we kind of take Again, our reference point and draw a reference um, a, a, a line to each individual point. If we now look at the angle of that point, so we've got distances and we've got angles here. If we look at the angle of that point, that's going to be different because if we look at the angle of all of these black points here, they're all going to be very similar. Whereas if we look at the angle of the green points, they're going to vary much more. So that's what, how we're going to take our p-dimensional time series and put it down into two-dimensional time series. We're going to take all of the distances from, the, from a pre-specified point um, to our data point in, in p-dimensional space. So we're going to have a time series of distances. And then we're going to take um, uh, the angles as well. And then we'll have a, ti a time series of angles. And those distances are going to give us mean changes and the angles are going to give us variance changes okay, from p-dimensional space. So that's what we're going to do. So I'm going to give you just an example here. Again, I'm, I'm using colors. So I've got a, uh, a matrix here where in the first instance, I've got um, normal naught one. So all of these here are normal naught normal one. And then I'm going to bind that with um, a matrix where the first set of columns um, are going to have um, a different mean structure. Uh, well, I should move this out of the way. Uh, yeah, so the first set of columns here are going to have the, the same um, structure. And then the second set are going to have now a mean of one. Okay. Uh, sorry, it's it's gone off the end. Um, if you look at the markdown, you can see precisely what I've simulated here. Okay. So you can clearly see this in the graph because it's like it's denser and darker color in this um, in this top uh, right corner than it is from elsewhere in the graph. And whilst I'm whilst the um, the method itself can't distinguish between which time series are changing. It is robust to the fact that only some of the time series are changing and not all of them. Okay. So I've just used the image command here just to kind of color this time series. Okay. You can see each of these kind of rows is a bit blocky because that's each individual time series. Okay. And so what I can do here then is, is I use, so this is the um, changepoint.geo package. And there's a function called geomcp. So geo is for geometric, and geom is obviously geometric here. Um, and so geometric change point approach. I just put in my my um, uh, my structure y. So I should probably say here that the structure is that um, each um, column is a so it's kind of different from what's going on here. So here we've got time is across the the um, bottom as it always is, and then each each kind of row so to speak here is is a different data set 
But when we think about it in terms of um, matrices, we always think of the columns being the, the different time points and the rows being the different variables, um, which um, may or may not be, um, oh, what am I talking about? No, it's the opposite way around. Um, the columns are the different time points because if you, if you just had one variable, you would have it as a one vector, which would go down. Um, and so each of the different um, columns is a different data set, which is kind of the, the transpose of, of what you're seeing uh, in here. Okay. So then we can just plot that result. And by default, it will automatically plot both the angle um, time series and the distance time series. So um, if you remember here, I simulated it so that there was a change um, in mean. And so therefore we, we have this angle measurement, which is um, wandering around, but there's no um, angle change points. So here there's, there's change points. We do label the distance change points on both of the graphs just so that you can see it, but there's no angle change points because there's, there's no um, index here that says angle, okay? And then under the distance side, it's kind of petering along and then you can see a huge jump here to a different mean. And so this is picked out. So once we've got the angle and the distance measures, uh, time series, we, we analyze these independently. Um, we're not saying that they are independent in themselves, but we, we analyze them independently because we found that gave uh, the most accurate results. And so therefore you will get distance change points and you will get angle change points coming through. Uh, typically speaking, distance is a change in mean and the angle is a change in variance. And so this is just an example where we just have a change in mean and we only get distance change points out. So the GeomCP package also includes uh, functions that will just calculate the angle and distance time series for you. So if you wanted to just take those angle and distance time series and analyze them separately yourself, then, then there are functions um, available to do that. Um, in essence, these two are under the hood analyzed using the pelt times uh, the pelt search method that we were talking about previously um, using a normal assumption and there is an option in John CP so we show inside the paper which I which I've linked to that um, for very 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 small numbers of time series then the um, kind of the normal assumption of these angle and distance measures is not met um, so typically it's a, it's a bit so what we're essentially doing here is is in the distance, you're, you're um, almost, you know, part of it is that you're averaging observations. And so if you're averaging over the times over um, a large number of observations, then that average will behave normally distributed. Um, but if you're averaging over a small number of observations, then it won't. So within the package, there's both um, the normal assumption, which is the default. And then there's also the empirical distribution in changepoint.np that we discussed um, two weeks ago. Um, and so that is an option for you to be able to use within the package as well. The output of this, this res object, um, is a JumpCP object, and that within it has these angle and distance measures. So either you can calculate them using the separate functions, or within this you can uh, strip out these two uh, and analyze them any way you want. Um, in preparing the slides for today, I, I did suggest um, to Tom, uh, my PhD student who developed this, um, that maybe we, we want to add in a crops option here because I think that would be really interesting. Um, so I think that's something that's on our list of things to do. So now I'm gonna take the same kind of initial example, but now I'm gonna show you a mean and variance, okay? So here we've got the, the, the same structure. So only this top right-hand corner here is, has a mean change but then I've added a variance change in the bottom half of the data. So that's kind of, um, so to, to the whole of the second half of the data. So we've got a, a, mean, a standard deviation going from one to two here. Okay. So you can clearly see, I think more so than the previous one, that there's clear differences between the left and the right here. But there also looks to be a difference between the top and the bottom on the right. Um, I should say that this is nice and easy to spot because obviously the way that I've simulated it is I've simulated them in blocks. And um, if you muddle up these time series, it's really, really difficult to see. <laughs> um, if you don't have, you know, the whole of the mean change in the top and you kind of intersperse them between. So we just do GeomCP again. 
And then this gives us um, the angle now has a, a change in mean in it, as does the distance. Um, and changes in mean are a lot easier to, to find than changes in variance. And so here we get the um, angle and distance both um, coincide with the change point here. So if you're interested in means and variances potentially changing at different time points, then you can have a look for the, a difference in the um, angle and the distance and you'll get different change points between the two. Um, the, the package itself doesn't actually, just gives you the angle and the distance change points. Um, you do get differences whereby uh, maybe the change point is at 100 and the angle might give you 100 and the distance might give you 101. And those are things that, that we've left the, um, the users to reconcile because often you might need some um, inside knowledge on the data to say which one of those might be more appropriate. Um, okay, so we're going to have another task now um, before I go on to the um, um, final part of, of the session today. So here we've got some data. Again, just, just like the last one, it's not as obvious uh, in the real data example as, as it is in the um, simulated data examples. That's always the case. Um, this is uh, ACGH bladder tumor data. It's from the ECP package. So if you, if you load the ECP package and then just do data ACGH, um, then you will be able to find that. And then again, I've just imaged this here just so that we can see. And you can clearly see there are periods where there are different um, behavior going on in different people. Um, there seems to be some commonality here across quite a few um, people, um, but not all uh, for certain time points, uh, for certain change point locations, I mean. So there's 43 patients here, so that's kind of the rows, and there's two, one, uh, 2,215 um, points across the genome where these patients have been measured. Uh, so I'm interested, you know, maybe um, use the uh, JumpCP package. How many changes do you find? Um, um, and what sort of changes are they? Are they, are they uh, distance changes or, or angle changes? So I'm gonna give you, um, we're gonna go just for a 10 minute break this time, just till two minutes pass uh, to give me enough time to go through um, the really new stuff that we're gonna talk about. Oh, so Oscar's just asked, um, he's confused about the angle for P time series more than two at a time, is the angle interpreted as the P minus one dimensional solid angle? Um, so the angle is interpreted as from the reference point. Um, so I, I should have said here, so the reference point must be, uh, so by default, it is one less than the, than the minimum in all um, time series, because we want everything to be in that upper quadrant. Because if we don't have everything in the upper quadrant uh, and you've got them across quadrants, then the angle measure um, gets distorted by that. So we make sure we transform it so that everything is, is in that upper quadrant. Um, and then the angle measure is from your, your reference point. Um, it, it's the p-dimensional angle to the, to the time point um, at that point. So I believe it can be interpreted as the p minus one dimensional solid. Um, but I'm not a... Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm not a person who's very um, versed with geometry, so I could be wrong with that. Um, okay, yep. So we'll, we'll come back at two, at two minutes past 10. So again, I'll monitor the chat if anybody has any questions as, as we go through. Um, what you found, so Oscar said he's got 27 distance and 18 angle change points, and he's not convinced by the graph. He's good. So let's let's have a look what we find. So I, sh I should say that this data um, has been analysed by both ECP and also Inspect. So Inspect um, chose the top sixty change points, um, and the um, ECP package found about, um, if I recall correctly, I think it was about um, forty something change points. Um, so let's have a look. So. The problem that we've got here is that um, the time axis is squished. So you can clearly see things are going on. You've, you've got clear upward and downward movement, but it's not really clear um, within this um, because, because the time axis is squished, it's, it's a lot harder to see. So I, I would encourage you to stretch it out. Um, 
the way that the markdown does it, that it's not um, as easy without a load of code that would um, just annoy you when you were working on your own machine. So um, I've kind of left it as it is, but I would encourage you to, in your R consoles, stretch that out there um, and um, look at the individual sets. Remember, this is, this is a lot longer than, than previous ones. This is 2,215 fitting in the same space where here we fit 200 time points. So what's going on here in 200 time points is, is going on in like a, a, a tenth here. Um, or even even smaller amount of, of space. Um, so just bear that in mind as, as, as you're looking at these. Um, so these are the kind of the default ones found. Um, what is interesting to see is, is that the majority of these, so there's not much here between uh, kind of just before 500 to just after 500. Um, it's hard to kind of picture that. that, that's kind of around this space here where there is, you know, majoritarily just um, orange. Uh, kind of the, the middling orange here uh, rather than the lighter and the darker. So that's kind of what that is picking up there. Whereas across the other spaces, there's kind of usually always something going on. So it seems a bit strange that there's not much going on here, but that that's kind of the reason why, because the majority of the time series are not changing that. Now in this application in particular, um, you want um, to be getting what the majority of patients are having. So if you're looking for genetic traits that might be uh, indicative of a bladder tumor or risk of a bladder tumor, then you want um, changes that are um, um, changes that are uh, for the majority of the patients coming in because the ones that are not for the majority of the patients are probably just um, um, genetic disposition of, of that patient that is not related to their bladder tumor. Okay, so what does the y-axis on the angle chart represent? So, so this is um, just the angle measurement. So this is the um, angle, uh, I believe in radians, but I would have to double check that in the, um, in the, um, in the help files. Um, it should say in the help files, if it doesn't, I will get it added. Um, but this should be the, the angle in radians. And then this is the, the distance in, in just units. Um, so this is, so the distance is going to be in the um, rescaled setting. So from the, the minimum of each. Okay. Here we go. Okay. So as I said, you know, one way that you can look at this is what we, what we discussed last time was around, um, well, how do we know how, what's the right um, uh, approach? Um, what's the right penalty function for this? So again, um, you can do this. So because the distance measure can be accessed, so you can just do distance of these out a CGH, then you can access directly that distant, this distance um, time series here just by doing this. And I can put that into, into pelt with crops uh, very easily um, and plot that out. This is the diagnostic plot for that, which kind of shows that maybe it's somewhere around here-ish. Um, although I could, you know, you could also argue for, for a bit earlier on as well. Um, so you can do that. And um, this is the functionality that I want to get put directly into the package uh, so that you don't have to do this separately. Um, but that's not there yet. So I'm now going to revert back to um, univariate change points. So some questions that were asked last time were around um, the kind of the probability of the change point being there. What confidence do we have in the change point location? Um, and I kind of discussed that there are some method out there to get confidence intervals for change points, but it kind of feels a bit um, kind of arbitrary to me because um, it, it, it doesn't feel like um, necessarily that that it's a useful metric um, for people. So I wanted to talk about influence because I think this is a more interesting um, concept for, for change points uh, for practitioners. Um, this is brand new, hot off the, um, hot off the mark. Um, this is joint work with Inez Wilms uh, from Maastricht University uh, and David Matteson, who's at Cornell. Um, we are about to submit the paper for this. And so therefore everything is coming out. Um, and the questions that we want to ask is, which data points are influential for the segmentation? So 
is is it that that change point is really there or is it just that there's one data point maybe that's influencing that change point being found so part of this is kind of looking at change points versus outliers so if you've got one outlier in your data then that naturally will inf in mean that you get change points and um, and we're going to kind of say how do we measure the influence and how stable is our attained segmentation so if i had slightly different data would i still get the same um same um, inference uh, so that you can think of this almost like a, a repeatability but not quite so i'm going to i'm going to run through this um example here um i'm not going to show you this on on real data because it's it's we don't have a lot of time i've only got 20 minutes and um, i want to have a little bit bit of time for discussion uh, and I feel that the concepts are, are a lot easier to, to look at in this kind of contrived example. So um, currently this is only available for changing mean. We're hoping to, to widen it later, but it's currently for changing mean um, for the, in, the, in the code. So I've got an, an obvious change in mean here from zero to five, really, really obvious. You know, no, I, I would not be anticipating that any individual data point here if that changed, that change point there would disappear. Okay, it's really, really obvious. I then put an outlier here um, at time point 100. So this is my outlier and that clearly has affected the segmentation because if that outlier was not there, would we say that these two segments here were different? And the answer is probably not. So the way that we've simulated here, the answer would be no, okay? And then I've put in a smaller change on this side where maybe some of the observations that are around there might be affecting the location of this change point. So you can kind of think some of this um, lower data here, maybe if these time point, if that time point there wasn't there, then maybe this would shift. Okay. So I'm kind of thinking, well, if I'm wanting to make decisions based on these change point locations, so I want to say that some, you know, this change point is there because something happened um, or this, you know, because of that change point, I'm going to change something in, in the way that we're doing things um, to rectify maybe an increase in number of cases or, or something like that. If we're wanting to make decisions based on these change points, then we need to know how our data that we have has influenced um, these change point locations. So that's kind of the aim. Um, so this, we've got some sources of inspiration. So in, Inez is um, a kind of robust statistics person. Uh, so she's kind of an expert in this area from, from a traditional robust um, statistics side. So we've got, um, we've, we've got um, influence um, measures are common in regression analysis and influence functions are really common in robust statistics, kind of looking at, well, how, how these, the data kind of um, affects your analysis. So when we were kind of discussing this, we, we kind of went, we're thinking about going down the influence functions route, but these change point locations, it's kind of, it's not just the change point locations that can be affected. It's also the, um, the kind of segment parameters and also the number of change points. And it wasn't really clear how, how this influence function idea kind of comes in. So we, we kind of just took inspiration from the aims of what these techniques are trying to measure. And so we've come up with two different routes of, of measuring influence in change points. One is it when you modify an observation and the other one is leaving an observation out. So this modifying an observation is, is essentially making an observation an outlier and seeing what happens to the segmentation. Um, when you make an observation an outlier, you are guaranteed to get a change point either side of that location. Um, so that means that you know, we've guaranteed that. So what happens to all of the rest of the data? So we know that that's going to introduce two change points. What happens to the rest of the segmentation? Does it completely break down or does it remain the same? Okay, so that's kind of looking at stability. And then leaving one out is, is kind of pretending we didn't get that observation in the first place. How does that affect um, what, what we are doing? So with that in mind, I'm gonna just kind of show you what happens so if I've got a change in mean here, I've got a segmentation going on here. If I add an outlier, then I will get two extra change points. And we know that there's theory um, from Paul Fernhead and Guillaume Regal um, 
from um, Lancaster and, and Paris respectively. They've done theory on this. It, it's known that that will happen. So what we're kind of looking at is, well, if we add the change point, so what we're going to do is, is you've got, a, you can add an outlier at any time point across here. So what we're going to do is one by one, we're going to add an outlier at every single time point and then see how the segmentation changes. We know what we should see, which is that we should get two change points added. Okay. And then this change point that is there should stay there. Okay. It shouldn't move. So we do that for, for kind of our example here. So we roll through the data, making every single observation an outlier and then see what happens. And so we've got, um, that's what this influence generate does here. So we've got using the PELT methodology for a change in mean. We've got, um, you just put that on the original data uh, and then you've got uh, method is modify. And then I will show you the delete method uh, later on as well. So we've then got different degradations of um, different granularities of information. So this is our overview. So this is stability overview. So this is a, a dashboard um, just showing you at a very, very high level what happens to your change points. Okay. So green, if a change point is labeled as green, that means it's okay. It doesn't move. It remains at the same location. It's always there regardless of what we do. Uh, with generating outliers through, throughout the data. If we have it labeled as red, that means that's an outlier in the first place. So this is a segment of length two, uh, sorry, a segment of length one for, for change in mean, it'd be a segment of length two for a mean variance. Um, and so that is red because that is something that is, is, remains the same throughout. And so if we add an outlier at that location, it doesn't change the segmentation when we would expect it to, okay? And then these orange ones, these are the really interesting ones because the orange ones are the ones where the change point either disappears or it moves, okay? So these are the ones we need to worry about, um, maybe, okay? But this is the very highlighted method here of just an overview. You can then drill down into what happens, okay? So we repeat this analysis for every single location being an, an outlier and so therefore we have 200 times that we've repeated our analysis and so the maximum number of change points that we can have is 200 at the same location so this one is green it hits the 200 bar that is why it is green it hits 200. this one is orange because it does not hit 200 which means that there are instances where either it moves or it gets deleted. And we can see here on this graph, this is where it moves to. So when it moves, it moves and it moves to the single location here, which is our small little black bar. But what you can see is that small little black bar plus this orange bar does not equal 200. So that means there are some time points where it gets deleted as well as being moved. So that's quite interesting. So this gives you the location stability. So this is the location of the change points. Where do they potentially move to? How do they get deleted? We can also look at the parameter stability. So I should say this is just location stability. We, we give it the change points and our influence measure um, there. And then the parameter stability is the same way. So it's just a parameter stability. We give it our influence measure and we give it the original means. So I do have to construct those original means because I'm not I'm wanting to make this general to all methods eventually. And so therefore um, the different um, objects that you get from different analyses will have different ways of characterizing that. So that's just why um, we have the original mean there you have to specify. And so it's interesting because if you think about this, when you make um, an observation an outlier that naturally shortens the segments either side. So this variability is what we expect to see is that when I have um, a, an outlier, you know, close to the edges of a segment, then the parameters are naturally going to move around. That's just natural variability there. So I naturally expect to see kind of like a bathtub shape to the segments, because as you put um, outliers towards the end of the segment, that mean is going to get more variable. OK. Um, and then you've got some observations here, which are maybe what I don't expect to see, which is, um, so I should say that the, the 
uh, colours here, um, every time point is spotted um, by the density of that occurrence. So these light grey ones don't occur very often, and um, the darker black they are, the more often they occur. So we can clearly see that we've got this, this kind of behavior here that doesn't occur very often, which is a very low mean around this, set, around this setting here. Um, and then we've got this maybe more worrying behavior because occasionally we've got a mean that is a lot higher um, than what we would expect it to be. And because it's darker, that happens much more often. So that that is a bit worrying, as is this um, extended um, kind of mean behavior here, whereby, um, and across this side, um, just after 150 as well. So these are, are all due to the fact that that change point either moves earlier, which is what this behavior is uh, above the, the mean here, or it disappears completely, which is why the mean of those observations um, can either increase or, or decrease. Uh, that happens when that change point is deleted, okay? So that can be interesting there. If you're more interested in the parameter inference than you are the change point inference. And then our final kind of level of, of um, um, granularity is what we're calling the influence map. Okay. Oh, so George S is adding, uh, would this type of analysis change in findings if you analyzed each segment in the three bits? Um, well, it would in the sense that the, in each of the three bits, you're then not looking at the, you know, the sensitivity of the change point location. Because um, if you split them up into the three different bits, then you, you wouldn't be looking at the sensitivity of the, of the change point um, in itself. But it is interesting that if, yeah, if, if you took, say, just a sub-segment, um, so for example, say I just took from 50 to 150, or, or maybe even from 100 to 200, um, what would I be looking at there? Um, the majority of what we're talking about here would stay the same, and I'll kind of talk about that with this influence map here. So this influence map is, is interesting because it shows us exactly what is happening and exactly when it's happening. So along the um, x-axis is time as it would be normally, and then the y-axis is um, which, you know, which point we have made an outlier. So down here at the bottom, we've got time point one is made an outlier. Up at the top at 200 is point 200 is made an outlier. And what is going on here is this is our residual. So it is what happened in reality versus what we expected to happen. So we've, we've taken away those two things. So because we expect to get an outlier, um, oh, we expect to get two change points around the outlier, we've deleted that effect from, from this here. And so you're looking at the residuals here. So um, white is good. So if white was everywhere, then nothing would have changed. Okay. Blue means we are deleting change points. So for these observations here, so um, around kind of 130 to 160 here, if we make an outlier at any, any, any time point around there, that change point, that orange change point at 150 disappears. Okay. And we know it disappears because um, it goes, the blue goes all the way to the end of, end of the data, which means that there is one less because of, um, of the, the index here, there's one less change point in that series than there was previously. And that starts at this orange change point location, which means that was the change point that was deleted. This red block here is where the change point is moved earlier. So for that small period of time, for these um, out, for making an outlier at these observations, that that um, uh, that orange change point there is there's one more change point than we expect just for that period of time, which means that that change point has moved earlier because it stops when we get to that change point location, which means that after that time, it's the kind of the right number of change points we were expecting. So it can take, you know, it can take um, a bit to get used to look, looking and, and, and saying, well, what does this map tell me? Um, but this is our kind of final, most detailed information about what's going on. I just want to contrast that just before we finish with um, what happens in the, the deletion case, because it's very, very different. So modifying, I'm basically taking an observation, making it an outlier, I'm breaking that segment. When I do the deletion, 
it's kind of less less um, strong. I'm just deleting an observation. I'm not really changing much about that segment. Um, so we still get that the first one is green, the middle one is red, and the last one is yellow, uh, is orange. Um, so we still need to be worried about that last change point, but in a different way. So this is again, just the same stability dashboard, but now we're using the deletion method instead of the modify method. So here you can see that what's going on here is not as strong as it is in the uh, modify method. But when I delete some time points, this um, orange bar here doesn't reach 200. You can see a little um, bump here at that, at that same location we saw for the modify method. And so we're still having the change point move, it's just not as much, okay? Uh, I should say that inside the code, you can kind of delete all of these true change point locations and just zoom in on, on, this, on this bottom part. And then again, the parameter stability. So here, because we're just deleting an observation, the length of the segment is staying the same. So we're not expecting to see as much par parameter instability. And that's what we see here. So we haven't got that kind of bathtub shape because we're making the segments shorter um, or anything like that. This is much cleaner. Um, and you can clearly see there that move um, of the change point location that is inducing that kind of earlier um, um, parameter instability. So, so if I wanted to make inference on the first part of the data, absolutely fine. That second part of the data, that's telling me that, you know, a, a confidence interval wouldn't tell me that this change point location can only move to one other location. A, chain, a, a confidence interval would just give me a range of plausible locations. And um, it doesn't, you know, it's, it's a continuous interval. It doesn't tell me that some are more plausible than others, which I think is, is what we get added here. And so the influence map here again is, is very, very similar, um, but it's mainly white, which is good. Here we've got the change point moving earlier in a different place. So it's only when we when we delete something very, very close to the true change point that we get that move. And that's a very, very small. It's only when we do one or two time points there and um, that we delete that that moves. So it's a, it's a smaller influence than than the modify method, uh, as, as would be expected. But now we've got this blue line here around um, um, the altered data point. And so this is, this is saying that there's one fewer change point all the way along. And this is because when we delete um, the outlier observation, we have deleted both of those change points. Whereas in reality, we would potentially only expect one of those change points to disappear um, because we would have expected that those two segments before the outlier and after the outlier would be different. Whereas in reality, what we're seeing here is we're seeing that those are being um, estimated as being the same. And so therefore, when we delete only the outlying observation, we have one fewer change point than, than we expect to, because the outline, when we get rid of the outlier observation, we expect only one change point to delete, but it's actually deleted two. Okay. Which is interesting that that change, that change point was only there. That, so those segments, if the outlier wasn't there, those segments would be the same. That's what that's saying. So I've kind of come to, to the end of what we're wanting to discuss. As usual, I've put too much in and I've waffled along too much. Um, I'm happy to stay around um, for a discussion if anybody does want to ask any questions towards, you know, um, when we stop recording. Um, so in summary, multivariate space is really interesting, but there's still loads of challenges in the univariate space. I haven't spoken about seasonality or changes in seasonality. If you're interested in that, um, Jamie Lee and I are currently working on a, on a project around that, as, as well as with other collaborators of mine. There's, there's stuff that's coming out around that uh, in terms of um, papers. I've got things already. Yep, George, the recording will be made available on the YouTube channel as the previous one was. Um, there's lots of stuff going on, both in the multivariate space, but also still in the univariate space. There's loads of interesting research here. Um, I'm getting more and more into the health technology space. So if anybody wants to collaborate on anything or if anybody wants um, any help or guidance as they're trying to put these techniques into work um, within the NHS um, or elsewhere, if, you, if, you, if you're looking at other health space, I'm really, really interested 
do reach out to me. Um, I do respond to my to my emails. Um, and also, if, if, if anything is confidential, do reach out to, to Jamie Lee as well. She's inside the NHS, so, so that, that should be easier um, for you to get advice if it is really confidential at that point. Um, so, yeah, so thank you very much for everybody. Thanks for all of your help. Thanks for all of your um, conversations and interactions as we've been going through. Um, and I look forward to you get, having you contact me about how you're going to try and use this. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, I just share the link in the uh, chat. Please fill the survey if you have a chance. It's just one, two minutes max. Um, and we will really appreciate your feedback. Um, and yes, once again, thank you, Rebecca, for uh, being here today. And thank you, Jamie, uh, for helping as well. Uh, I think there are some possible questions. So I will stop recording right now and uh, we can answer questions. Thank you.